Welcome to the WRL Daily Download. I'm Ken Smith. In this special bonus episode, I talk with former North Carolina State Senator Floyd McKissick Jr. about his father, civil rights leader Floyd McKissick Sr., and a debate McKissick Sr. invited Malcolm X to in 1963. McKissick Jr. also recounts his childhood of civil rights activism and how it's translated into a career in public service. I started by asking him to list his public service titles over the years. Get ready. The list is long. Well, let's see. I was uh, a member of city council here in Durham uh, for eight years. Um, I was in the state senate for uh, 13 plus years. I serve as a utility commissioner today. I was appointed there by the governor. And of course, uh, you know, we had to be ratified by the state house, state senate, so a utility commissioner. Uh, I've been um, chair of the Durham County Democratic Party, been chair of the Warren County Democratic Party. You know, so I've had so many titles over the years uh, that they've all been uh, rather interesting. Hmm. Take us back to when you were a little boy growing up, your dad very involved in the civil rights movement, one of the founders of CORE, Congress for Racial Equality. As as a young boy, were you aware of, of the work that your father was doing and the importance of it? I was very much aware of it and, and aware of the importance of it because uh, you were surrounded by that work all, at all times. I mean, there were people meeting with my dad all the time that were civil rights leaders. He was always involved in either litigation that was related to civil rights, to desegregating schools, or to economic boycotts, or to voter registration drives, or to whatever the issue happened to be. So you were very much aware of of all of this because you were living it each and every day. So take me back to the time when he invited Malcolm X. Tell me that story of how that all came about. Sure, uh, there was the, the idea was to bring Malcolm X to Durham, that they were gonna have what was theoretically gonna be billed as a debate. Um, uh, North Carolina Central University uh, d- did not want to host the event. It was supposed to be hosted at a place called W.D. Hill Community Center here in Durham, uh, in the African-American community. It was a city-owned property. Uh, They said it couldn't be held there. So it was held at a place called the Pine Tree Taxi Stand, where downstairs they dispatched taxis, but upstairs there was an auditorium known as Page Auditorium that probably could hold about 100 or 150 people. And that's where it ended up being? That's that's exactly where the debate took place. I, I attended the debate. In fact, I saw Malcolm earlier that afternoon when they weren't sure if the event was going to be able to occur. Uh, He was at my father's law office uh, and there were media and press who were there at the time. But I stopped by my dad's law office at least three days a week to kind of make money doing chores, to be completely Mm -hmm. candid. As a little boy, what was that like for you meeting Malcolm X, looking back? Uh, It was pretty exciting. It was interesting. It was fascinating. But he wasn't unlike other civil rights leaders I had met, like Roy Wilkins in that time frame, or uh, James Farmer, Congress of Racial Equality. You know, in later years, I met, you know, Martin Luther King. So, I mean, I I met so many of them, uh, and so many of them were like uncles to me. I mean, they were family friends. I mean, so often when people came to town, they spent time with you, and they spent time in your home. It wasn't uncommon at all. Why was Malcolm different? Why why was Malcolm X different for you? Malcolm was just different in that I think he had a a more um, controversial reputation. I mean, people thought that he might be somebody that would incite violence and things of that sort. But his uh, demeanor, his appearance was pretty calm. I mean, in fact, he and my father were very jovial. I mean, they, they, they seemed to get along quite well. And they were just determined to find a place to hold that debate that evening, uh, there was no doubt that it was going to be held. The question was where, and it wasn't a matter, even if places were being closed or they said it couldn't be held there because of some type of threats that could occur um, because people were concerned about Malcolm X. Mm. I mean... Um, and his it, rhetoric. Yeah, and his rhetoric at that time. I mean, and, and really, I think so many of the threats were coming from the white community, um, from those who were in the Ku Klux Klan, from those that were uh, part of other groups or organizations that were opposed to, uh, to integration, uh, that were basically segregationists and didn't want to see anybody come here. They considered Malcolm X another outside agitator. 
almost all of the leaders in the civil rights movement were viewed as outside agitator, and he was another, another outside agitator that they didn't want to see come to Durham. When you say it was a debate, a debate among whom? Well, theoretically, it was supposed to be a debate between my father and Malcolm X. Uh, when it really got down to it, they agreed upon so many things. My father had been active in representing uh, members of the Nation of Islam uh, that he was a part of. Uh, my father had been active in representing uh, the NAACP and folks in sit-ins and demonstrations. So the question was, what was integration as opposed to assimilation? Uh, Malcolm X seemed to feel that if African Americans integrated, that they would also assimilate white values and they would become more a part of white society and lose their identity and lose their culture. My father felt that you could desegregate and integrate and still remain separate in terms of having your identity, your culture. You did not have to acquire white values. So it's more a question of assimilation into white society versus uh, what I would call African Americans remaining a culture that was unique, identifiable, that could successfully integrate into the American mainstream and share a part of that economic mainstream. So you were in the sixth grade, so that made you how old? I would have been about uh, 10, 11 years old. Yeah. As you look back on that night, that debate, you were there as a little boy. What impact do you think it had on you? I found it fascinating because there really wasn't what I thought of as a debate. Uh, I saw a lot of agreement. Uh, they both believed in black enterprise. They both believed in economic development and black businesses. Uh, they both believed that African Americans deserved a better quality of life. Um, the thing that impacted me was that uh, Malcolm X was that controversial that they would close down places where he could not speak because that event did not result in any type of controversy that I thought was unique or unusual. He was just another leader in the civil rights movement who was coming to Durham like so many others had in that time frame. How do you think that experience as a little boy ended up shaping your life as an adult? I think it shaped me immensely because I saw what changes were coming in society. I saw what desegregation meant. And I was one of those kids that desegregated public schools here in Durham that went into a classroom as the first black, you know, in, in my particular sixth grade class. So, I mean, I saw what it meant to have the same rights, the same opportunities as whites in society at that time. So I think it caused me to want to uh, fight for those same type of principles with the same type of convictions, to, to become a lawyer, uh, to become involved in politics, to fight for equal rights for all. Uh, you couldn't help but be inspired to do that when you saw so many leaders that were fighting that common cause, fighting that common effort, determined to make us a more just, a more equal society. You couldn't help but inherit those traits and those characters and those principles that you saw articulated. And you inherited those traits and characteristics as a, at a very early age being on the picket line. As a, on the picket line. I mean, there's a picture which I uh, shared with you when I was nine years old uh, picketing a place called Royal Ice Cream, where there's a historical marker today that says that's where the first sit-ins occurred in, in uh, North Carolina, as I recall. It was June 23rd, 1957, before the sit-ins over in, in Greensboro at, at A&T. So, so at the time, did you know what you were doing in terms of being out on that picket line? What, wh oh, yeah. what, did, you, what did your dad tell you? Well, I mean, I enjoyed picketing. I, I thought of picketing as a, a, a fascinating past time. I used to enjoy helping to make the picket signs and, and write with markers on the picket signs. And the picket sign that I had was one that was uniquely tailored for a small person to carry around my neck. So I wanted to picket. I mean, I wanted to participate in those demonstrations just like uh, uh, my sisters were doing, just like so many others in the community were doing it that were young people at that time. And, and the interesting thing about Royal Ice Cream is that um, it, it was owned uh, by, by uh, whites in this community. But probably one of the most interesting things is that my sixth grade class, which I integrated, uh, my teacher's father was one of the broiler, brothers in, that owned Royal Ice Cream. Uh, his name was Purcelli. And uh, 
uh, of course, uh, as a person picketing in front of that place, and then later ending up integrating uh, sixth grade in her classroom, uh, I'm sure she probably thought of me as the son of Satan. <laughs> <laughs> but but nevertheless, you know, you knew you were there, and you knew you were there for a purpose, and uh, you know, um, you knew that when you were integrating schools, it was for a purpose, Des despite the fact they might try to spit, you know, spit, send spitballs your way, or trip you in the hallways, or treat you like a second-class citizen. You knew you were there, not only representing yourself, but representing your race. We'll be back after the break with more from my conversation with Floyd McKissick, Jr. Welcome back to the WRL Daily Download and my conversation with Floyd McKissick, Jr. I asked him what it was like to integrate schools as a child. It was a challenging experience. I mean, you were not treated well. You weren't treated respectfully. If you were on a stairway, somebody might try to trip you. Or if you were in a restroom, uh, one of the urinals, somebody might try to even you know, urinate on you. Uh, people would, as I say, they'd take spitballs and, and, and throw them your way or throw them through a straw. Uh, they would do anything they could to hum humiliate you. Uh, the N-word was used every day. You, you'd always hear about what their daddy was going to do to your daddy. Now, there were good kids among those kids that were hateful and despicable, that were racist. There were ones that would, uh, would be your friends. There were ones that were uh, open to a, a black person being there. But sometimes the reason they were open was because they had been around blacks. Either their families had been in the military, which had des desegregated, or they were families that actually had nannies in their home, where you might have a child who grew up loving that person who was their nanny, who treated them well, who treated them in a way that was dignified, so they didn't have a personal reason to have hostility against you because you were black. When you look back on your father's work in the civil rights movement, how much do you think that was a gift that he was giving to you growing up? I mean, it, it, it was a gift to me to observe it. It was a gift to me to learn from it. It was a gift to me to see what we needed to fight for. Uh, you know, we, there were people that would sit on our front porch at night with shotguns uh, to protect us from dusk dark to the break of dawn. I understood that it was important to fight for principles with conviction and, not, and to have courage and not to be deterred and defined by the way other people treated you. The fact that other people treated you uh, in an undignified way, the fact that other people treated you as a chimpanzee rather than as a human being, could not define who you were. You had to have in internal courage, internal conviction. You had to have strength of character. You had to know that you could do whatever you needed to do and wanted to do and overcome those circumstances, notwithstanding the racist, segregationist attitudes that you were confronting daily. All instilled by your father. All instilled by my father. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and, and you wanted to fight to overcome those things. Mm. Uh, I, I'm sure if you were to survey those in my sixth grade classroom and uh, ask, you know, who would be among the most successful upon them and say, you know, who one day would get graduate degrees from Harvard and Duke and Carolina, who would serve eight years on city council, who would work in our nation's capital with major law firms, who would serve 13 years in the state senate. No one would have thought that that one person would have been me as the black kid, yet I'm the only one who did it. And today I stand up for every child in every classroom that would never be picked, who deserves those same opportunities, regardless of their race, their religion, their gender identity, um, sexual orientation, that deserves simply the opportunity the opportunity to excel and to have people believe in them. That's all it takes. Mm, belief. What's, what was the name of the school? Uh, North Durham School. North Durham School, as a sixth grader. As a sixth grader. I mean, the school as a building still exists today. It's no longer part of the public school system. It's a, a building owned by a group called TROSA here in Durham, a substance abuse group. Yeah, yeah, a wonderful substance abuse program. But ironically, one time as a member of city council, uh, Trosa hosted us at that particular building. 
And the room that they hosted us in was my sixth grade classroom. And to return to that sixth grade classroom as a city councilman and to speak and to uh, host a breakfast there uh, was, was actually quite a humbling experience to think that uh, one day that I would return there under such circumstances. But uh, there's, there's lots of irony in history. Getting back to that Malcolm X visit, when you think about it now, how did it shape the triangle at that time? What impact did that visit have on, on your community, on you? At that particular point in time, he was a, a controversial leader. He was some, one of those that was active in the nation of Islam. I'm not sure the nation of Islam was well understood. It was thought of as a separatist organization. Um, I think that as Malcolm grew, as Malcolm changed, his ideas changed over time uh, after his visit to Mecca. But, but it was very controversial. Um, I don't think it deserved the controversy that it received. I think Malcolm was, some, was, was misunderstood, uh, that Malcolm's message was misunderstood. I think he was extremely principled and what he needed to say needed to be said. But to some extent, I don't think he was the type of person who was as radical as he was perceived to be based upon what I heard him say, what I heard him speak, and what I saw between my father and him as our personal relationship uh, in addition to what he spoke of during the so-called debate. Do you think your dad, looking back, did he ever express any conflict in terms of, was he conflicted with Malcolm X's progressive message versus Dr. King's nonviolent approach to the civil rights movement? I think my dad had his own approach as the leader of CORE. Uh, you know, he was among those 10 leaders that spoke at the famous march on Washington and met with President Kennedy that day. Uh, CORE was involved in the sit-ins years ago. They were involved in the freedom rides. Um, they were involved in boycotts. NAACP tended to be more involved in litigation. My, the thing my dad liked about CORE was that they were direct action, and he appreciated that direct action nature of who, who they were. And, and my dad was among those who embraced the idea of black power. But he, when he defined it, he talked about black economic power, to have access to capital, to build uh, businesses, to be able to hire your own, or to be able to compete in the American economic mainstream. He talked about black political power, to elect people to public office at a time where you did not have black mayors, you had very few black members of Congress. So we talked about establishing black nationalism with countries in Africa that were uh, you know, becoming decolonized for the first time, like uh, Zambia and, 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 and Tanzania and, and, and many others. Uh, so I mean, he defined a different role, a unique role, and uh, it, it was in a position that was different from King, different from Malcolm X, and, and became unique in terms of the way that he viewed the civil rights movement and the progress that needed to be made in America. Yeah. For every action, there's a reaction. Yeah. And there's, there was direct action. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and I think my father's vision was also controlled by the fact that he had seen what happened after the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Uh, what got rid of discrimination as we knew it, with restrooms and lunch counters and uh, you know things of that sort. He had seen what happened with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It got rid of literacy t- tests and got rid of poll taxes. He saw what happened when fair housing laws passed, which got rid of you know open discrimination in housing. But he could see that there were many African Americans that were living in urban ghettos that were lacking opportunity, where there was unrest, and where they felt like they still wanted to be part of that American mainstream. And he could see that we needed to do more to overcome prejudice and racism in America. It wasn't just about eliminating segregation in the South. It was about looking at the plight of African Americans all across America, the North, the South, the East, the West. And that brought about a different level of consciousness Mm. and a different level of commitment that needed to be addressed by a movement 
at that time. Yeah. And one more thing, you mentioned that that debate almost didn't happen. Yes. Because so many venues were turning their back on the idea of Malcolm X speaking there. What was that like for your father and, and, and for you as a little boy looking at that? Well, they were determined that it was going to take place. They were determined that regardless of what venues were going to be closed, that they were going to find a place where they could speak. And this Pine Street taxi stand and the Page Auditorium was one of those places. And it was a place, I think, where members of the Nation of Islam would frequently go to as well. So it became a home. It became an opportunity. It was already kind of a neighborhood community center. But that night, it became the heartbeat and center of Durham in hosting that debate and elevating that dialogue about assimilation versus integration and what that meant in blacks being able to maintain their identity even though they were desegregating the South and, and opening up opportunities for equal access for all. Thanks for listening to the WRL Daily Download. Another great way to get WRL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. It's a daily email that's waiting in your inbox every morning with triangle news, events, and headlines to get you ready for the day. Sign up at WRL.com newsletter.